I'm pleased to introduce Mel Anarud as our facilitator for today's 50th anniversary celebration. Mel, please well, good morning. your mic and take it away. Well, good morning and welcome to Pilgrim House. As, as Bill said, we're gonna do some parts of our program a little differently this Sunday than we normally do. We're doing Joy's concerns and announcements after we stop recording. So it'll be at the end of the program. We will, however, light our chalice. Uh, it is 50 years since Pilgrim House was formed and moved to the one room schoolhouse at 1212 Highway 96 in Arden Hills. Today, Pilgrim House remains a vibrant, active religious community true to the spirit of its foundation. We continue to welcome all, regardless of race, gender, sexual or spiritual orientation. We have no creed that we follow, except for the openness to ideas where we can explore, develop and apply our own individual beliefs with the acceptance and the encouragement of our fellow pilgrims. For everyone, again, if you put your uh, thing on speaker view rather than landscape or group view, it, uh, the program will probably be better for you. Uh, many people have parts today. All those people have an agenda. And Bill has, we should everyone be muted. When your time comes, unmute yourself and, 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 and mute yourself back up again when you leave. We hope. Uh, to still have the program completed approximately by 11.30. And um, then there we will have introductions, joys, concerns, and discussions after the program is, uh, and we take off recording. Okay, so we will begin today with uh, Bill Rohde at the, for the beginnings of Pilgrim House. Bill, it's back to you. Hello, Mel. Thank you. Three transformative events were in play at the same time during the 60s and 70s. The social turbulence erupting around the Vietnam War, the coalescing of the civil rights movement and quickly evolving social norms. It was a turbulent time. Major riots were occurring in cities across the United States and beyond. Here in the Twin Cities, we had the North Minneapolis riots of 1967 and Selbydale St. Paul riots of 1968. In 68, Martin Luther King was assassinated in April and president, uh, presidential candidate Bobby Kennedy in June. The unpopular Vietnam War was raging, ultimately resulting in some 58,000 US military deaths. Almost every one of my generation knows a close friend or relative who was killed in Nam. On the lighter side, Woodstock took place in August of, two, of 1969, ushering in the age of Aquarius. And the Vatican II initiated the early steps toward modernizing Catholicism. It was a profound time of turmoil and societal change. Against that broader backdrop, St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Roseville elected to embark along a more liberal and socially active path, hiring as their minister, Dick Otten. Dick brought a fresh and liberating perspective, particularly appreciated by young people like me at the time, I was actually young then, and by many associated uh, with the university. But these directions also raised considerable discomfort in others. Tenthens of uh, St. Michael's rose to the breaking point. Some of the church's elders ultimately called synod theologians from three different seminaries to examine Dick's teachings. Their conclusion affirmed that they were well within the bounds of modern Lutheran theology. Notwithstanding that assessment, the congregation's divisions remained deep and were unlikely to be healed. Several of us began meeting in homes to discuss possible alternate directions. Out of those discussions came Pilgrim House. In UU terms, we now call it building your own theology. Our discussions examined and debated everything, large and small. Would we have a creed? No. Would we have baptism? No. Through these questions and others, we formulated a vision to open to, uh, that was open to various traditions, Christian and otherwise, where everyone was encouraged to discover their own individual religious philosophy. It was that idea that brought us to calling ourselves Pilgrim House, a place where people could pursue their own journeys of spiritual discovery within a stimulating, supportive 
nurturing community. Our major thought leaders were Dick and Dorothy Otten, along with university professors Harold Jensen and Al Link. But everyone was equally engaged and involved. Our first Sunday meeting at the local ski chalet had 102 attendees. But that number did decline over time as some realized they were philosophically more closely aligned with the traditional church. Later, we began attracting other fellow searchers who found an intellectually challenging community here. In the remaining time this morning, you'll hear more about how those kernels of ideas from our formation in the 70s grew to build the Pilgrim House we know and love today. So we now turn to Vicki Ott and Kristen to lead us through the next step of our Pilgrim House journey. Vicki, you can unmute mute and take it away. Hi, I'm Vicki Kristen. My father, Dick Otten, founded Pilgrim House. I'm sorry if some of this is just really redundant over what Bill said because he did a great summary. Um, anyway, my father founded Pilgrim House and with a lot of help from my mom, Dorothy Otten. And my dad died in 1997 and my mom died in 2013. I was only 10, that's why you've got me. I was only 10 when Pilgrim House began. Therefore, my memories are that of a grown up child and possibly skewed as time tends to do with all memories. One of the really great things about celebrating 50 years of PH as we called it, do you still call it PH? Or is it always, okay wanted to make sure you knew what I was talking about, um, is seeing that some of the people who worked so hard with my dad are still, you know, to get it started, are still around and active today. It began as a non-denominational community of acceptance for all people. Part of the Pilgrim House philosophy was to welcome questioning about everything. PH's founding was very much a part of the times, as Bill said, which included the Vietnam War, um, riots, and a lot of unrest in society, as well as the racial, the civil rights movement. Um, against that, Pilgrim House was sort of a refuge um, from that in the form of a close-knit community, which often felt more like a family. Pilgrim House was very loosely based on the original Pilgrim's quest for religious freedom on their new journey. It was obviously not based on their actual religious philosophy. My first memory of Pilgrim House was of helping Judy Rohde and undoubtedly others take care of babies in a tent on the hillside outside of the original A-frame. That was the first nursery. Um, in that was I think in August of 1970 but by November of 1970 we had moved to the one room schoolhouse and the nursery was in the basement which was a little bit more normal. <laughs> I was always with the babies and children during the meetings as my father called them. I did go upstairs though for the fellowship time following the meetings that was how I got to know a lot of the members. There was no RE program at the beginning um, I think by 73 or 74, maybe 75, not sure on the year, there was some fairly loose programming just starting. The program I remember best had everyone bring their favorite song, share it, and tell why it was their favorite. The, I have no idea what the lesson was supposed to be there, but the great thing about the RE programming was that it was so much fun. We didn't even realize we were learning. You know, the, the lessons didn't seem like lessons. They were just fun. So anyway, there always seemed, some of my other memories, there always seemed to be a lot of people at our apartment and my mom did a lot of entertaining. After my mom got so sick in 1973, her focus shifted away from as much entertaining because she literally could not do it. Um, she did, however, still see Pilgrim House as her family, as we all did. The music seemed to be an integral part of PH, and it was wonderful. I remember lots of joyful singing along with the piano, guitars, a bass, 
and probably other instruments that I'm forgetting. Um, Bridge Over Troubled Waters was my favorite. I also remember helping to set up for potlucks and the annual bazaar, which was a fundraiser every fall. One of my friends and I always made mints to sell at the bazaar. And that's all I've got for right now. So Carol, you're the next one up. Carol Cook. I mean, Carol, uh, I'm sorry. Carol Gross. Carol Gross, yes. Bill should be taking care of the music at this point. Susan Sutter. Before Carol uh, played this song, we, were, we have a lot of our, our long ago favorites today. Um, and our tradition for those of you that uh, haven't been involved with our previous virtual programs is uh, we invite you to sing along, but sing along on mute. So uh, uh, think about that as we go forward here. Susan Sutter. Okay, I'm gonna be uh, speaking to uh, the section called Finding Our Way specifically financial and membership crisis. Um, our small group had the expense of a counselor and a mortgage and an endeavor that was hard to explain to potential members. The UUA affiliation was still off in the future. So how are we to pay for this when there was no framework to attract members? Here are some extracts from the Pilgrim House board, board meetings with difficulties paying Dick being particularly poignant. 
In September 1970, we started paying Dick Otten as a counselor. In December of 70, there were 70 members and 33 giving units. Fundraising was an issue as PH struggled to sustain itself. Art fairs were held annually, first with a memorable auction of a handmade quilt stitched over several months at the Potter House in Roseville, followed the next year by the auction of a cedar strip canoe built by PH members. And these were very fun events for those of us that participated in them. Dick Otten loved pottery and used the PH basement as a workshop. The old building had cinder block walls, concrete floor, open ceilings, and little heat. We found three kick wheels and installed an electric kiln for firing. Many of us learned to throw pottery there, but Ron Hensman was probably our star student. Dick and Ron taught pottery with fees going to Pilgrim House. In 71 and 72, our yearly income was $18,000, including $1,209 in profits from art fairs and $1,400 in proceeds from pottery classes and art classes. In 74, we saw the loss of key donors. Sadly, we were forced to reduce Dick's salary. We applied for a $2,000 loan from St. Anthony Bank to be repaired from art fair income. Other income came from a Steve and Nancy Grendahl concert and Julie Smith held a PET seminar. In May of 74, the checkbook balance was $23. In September of 75, Dick discussed his financial situation with the board, including the realization he will have to find full-time employment elsewhere. In October of 75, it was suggested that we open discussions with the White Bear Unitarian Church. However, nothing came of this. In December of 76, a letter from Dick Otten to the board giving up his role as paid unpaid counselor. And in September of 77, the decision to terminate Pilgrim House, if necessary, was discussed. But then, February 1978, we had a huge breakthrough. An offer was received for the south 148 feet of our property as part of the Karst Lake housing development. In June of 1978, the membership was 45. So by October 1979, the balance from the sale was $15,000. What a relief. At this point, we had $12,000 in CDs as a cushion for further development. So now I'll turn it over to Wayne LeBlanc to talk about the UUA affiliation. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Can you hear me okay? Okay. In 1983, I volunteered to be chair. We had an identity problem with Bible toting people coming in Sunday. And in 10 minutes, they were, they could see that we were not a fundamentalist religion and they left. So that was a real problem. I often had lunch with Ellen Karstens at Sperry Univac and asked him about Pilgrim House. He said, you sound like a bunch of Unitarians. I didn't know what they were and shortly investigated and decided that the UUA was close to the Pilgrim House philosophy. An association would greatly expand our presence. I called Boston and I called several places locally, the UUA, and got speakers and we had a series of Sunday programs. I remember a question from geneticist Ralph Comstock. If Pilgrim House disbanded, why would we give our assets to the, U, uh, to the UUA? Big question, why would we do that? But I said, according to our bylaws, Rudy would get it. Rudy would get everything. And that was Rudy Perpich, the governor of Minnesota. So to me, the UUA was way closer in our philosophy than the state of Minnesota. And in my mind, that was the question that sealed the deal. And so people were pretty well convinced to switch. So I didn't know this date, but on September 11th, 1984, the Pilgrim House voted to join the Unitarian Universalist Association. Thank you very much. And I even have a t-shirt. <laughs> Carol, you're up next, Carol Cook. 
All right, apologize that my video is not um, working for me this morning. So I want to share regarding the transition of leadership of the service from Dick Otten to volunteer facilitators, but I'm going to take a little detour first. My sister Lisa Berglund, Berglund and I were invited to Pilgrim House by my high school friend Chris Anderson. She had heard about PH and I'm remembering she came by herself first and then thought it'd be a good place for my sister and I that we might we might like it we might fit in we might find what we were looking for. Lisa and I are remembering that this was likely the fall of 1972. When did our mother Dory Gamble decide to join us on our journey? We're not sure. However, we're thinking it was sometime in the next year or so. On then to the leadership of the service of PH. The transition then was from Dick Otten, 1970 to 76, as you've heard, full-time counselor, minister equivalent, switched to Guy Hoagland, 76 to 77, part-time paid coordinator. This was the start of the program uh, planning committee. Went to Art Musel, 77, 78, again, part-time uh, paid co coordinator. And then Dory uh, started around uh, ish, 1980-ish um, to about 2005-ish. Um, she was a, vol a volunteer coordinator and facilitator, and she became certified to officiate weddings and funerals, taking on the role of PH counselor. Dory also took on membership responsibility, acting as greeter, encouraging visitors to sign visitor cards, uh, later membership forms, kept track of program attendees. And then there was a gradual transition from Dory uh, to the core of volunteer facilitators that we now have leading the program. Now, it's hard to believe Dory's been gone now for seven years. However, uh, her memory lives on. So she not only kept uh, de detailed records of membership, she saved her notes for the program she facilitated. I found the following from 1987, opening and closings that she used several times. Today and every day is what we choose to make it. We can choose to be loving, kind, friendly, joyful and affirming. We have personal power over our feelings, our attitudes, our behavior in every instance. And these closing remarks in the spirit of Dory's fondness for repetition. Today, we can choose to be loving and kind, we can give love to others, knowing that the more I give, the more I will have. Today will be what I choose to make it. One last tidbit from Dory from the meditation that she gave on the 25th anniversary of Pilgrim House. We come together at Pilgrim House to share our lives, to learn together and explore our spirituality. It's a safe place where we can be our beautiful, unique selves a place of acceptance, of differentness. This is indeed a place for us to nourish our spirits. Lolly's up. Thanks, Carol. Oh, brings back memories. So our program committee, as you just heard, I didn't even know where it originated, so that's pretty cool. Um, is a necessary part of our operation. Without Sunday morning programs, there would be little reason for us to meet. We still like to socialize, but I'm not sure we keep everybody here. As I'm sure you've heard before, we try to have a balance of programs, spiritual, intellectual, and musical. Programs that are aimed at meeting our spiritual needs are sometimes led by ministers or interior, intern, uh, interns, inter, ministerial interns, that's what I'm struggling to say. We found over the years that our spiritual needs are unique and personal, each of us, and that what is spiritual for some may not be spiritual for others. So sometimes we have many spiritual programs in a row because everybody's needs are being met. We also provide programs that help us learn new things. We focus on science, social justice, and a lot of politics, especially this year. Many of these programs are presented by experts in the field, Lots of times they're uh, professors from local um, universities or colleges. We, and then our third part is the, uh, we're, as Dick's daughter said, we're still a very musical group. We love our music. So we also try to make an effort to have Sunday's programs that are led by musicians, either ones that we participate in or we just enjoy. 
Um, since I've started being program chair, we've started doing surveys. And I don't remember if we did surveys when Dory was here or not, but we've gone to do, trying to do it twice a year. And our point for doing the survey is to give you an opportunity to tell us how we're doing. I hear many people saying that they can't remember every program or they weren't there and that's okay because I wasn't there every time either and I don't remember them all, although I, maybe I should. But the ones you remember, it's probably because there was something there that impacted you either in a positive or negative way. And the program committee does listen to what you say. We look at the surveys and it helps us plan what we're gonna do next and if we should have a speaker back or not. We also value having our members provide programs. It's not as common as it was in the early days, um, but it's still important. It helps us build the community and helps us learn to value one another. So if you'd like to share your knowledge with Pilgrim House and your Pilgrim House family, please let us know. Um, the next portion of the program is going to be led by Darlene and Carl Joyce and Laura Chaffee talking about the RE. Take it away. Good morning. I hope everybody can hear me. If you can't, somebody wave at me. <laughs> uh, first of all, our section is called the Foundations of RE and I have to do a shout out because the real founder of RE at Pilgrim House is Judy Potter. And we are so blessed to have our founders still with us, many of them. Um, and I will be forever grateful to them. Uh, number two, uh, I want to, to um, comment on the growth we had because despite all those dire things that were happening around us, we did by about 1985 when I took over RE for a decade, um, we were known as the children's church amongst all UU felt congregations. And the reason for that is we had grown to 67 children in five different age groups. And we had five different groups with volunteers for all of them. Um, much has been made of the wonderful UUA curriculums that we joined, uh, thanks to Wayne and others. And, and that's absolutely true. But what I'd like to leave you with is it was a little bit like a three or four leg stool in RE. Uh, the curriculums alone would not have done it. There was a secret sauce that went with those curriculums. And it had to do with volunteers coming from the whole congregation, not just parents, not just young people, all age groups contributed. Um, and especially our families bonded and that was that was the big secret to making it all gel and work is we had so many different kinds of social activities and whole families took part. And without that, we would not have been the children's church, trust me. And that's what it's gonna take going forward. And uh, so I'd like to close and I hope I kept it to a minute. Under a minute 30, I tried hard. Um, I have a fun story you asked me later, I'll tell you a fun story about the beginning of the teen program, which we didn't have when I started. But today it gives me great joy to look out at the pictures of all of you watching and see our adult children who once were the children in our RE program. I love them with all my heart and I thank you for my memories. <laughs> yeah. Carl, take it away, <laughs> please. Thanks mom. And then Laura. Thanks, Mom. From 1991 to 1995, as I arrived each day at my public high school, I would walk past a throng of students, including most of the popular ones, quietly gathered in a prayer circle around the flagpole. Mom, do you mind unmuting uh, yourself? Thank you. Um, I'll start that over. From 1991 to 1995, as I arrived each day at my public high school, I walked past a throng of students, including most of the popular ones, quietly gathered in a prayer circle around the flagpole. They never overtly attacked any of non-participating students. Some would always make eye contact though, forcing us to lower our heads to avoid their gaze. Their purpose was clear, join us or miss out. Though they never spoke during these prayer circles, they did speak at other times. 
one day in AP literature class empowered by the book Barabbas and by the fact that earlier in the term, our teacher made it clear that he was a religious Christian and one of the flagpole acolytes made a bold claim. Modern society, she argued, was betraying Jesus just as Barabbas had done. We all knew immediately that she was talking about the recent controversy over Tom Hanks kissing another man in the movie Philadelphia. Encouraged by the teacher in a silent room, she moved on to evolution, claiming that humans and dinosaurs walked the earth at the same time, evidence that man was to take dominion over the earth and that to conserve the environment rather than enjoy its bounty was further betrayal. Her claim was a lie. Millions of years separated dinosaurs and people. I use the word lie here intentionally. I believe that this otherwise intelligent AP Lit student truly believed what she was saying. She had learned it from the local Lutheran parish, which is now a megachurch. The pastor, in turn, had learned it from a broader movement that was sweeping the nation at the time, the religious right movement. That movement did not care about dinosaurs or paleontology at all. It did, however, care about the faith that its youth would place in its way of thinking. This particular lie was fabricated specifically to keep the more scientifically minded youth from straying too far from the flock. By addressing a big question, the mo mo uh, that movement hoped to stave off further questioning. Around the same time, a UU religious education peer of mine, Kelly LeBlanc, was asked to make a presentation to PH very similar to this one. She was asked the question, what do you find most challenging about being a UU? Her answer is stuck with me to this day, not having all the answers. Not having all the answers was the hardest thing about being a UU to Kelly. She went on to explain that her public school had similar prayer circles to mine, and many of her peers participated in them. When she would speak with them, they always knew exactly what to believe. Their church gave them all of the answers they could possibly need to every question, especially the tough ones. Even back then, though, Kelly knew that she had been empowered with something that her peers had not. She knew deep down that sometimes doing the right thing means doing the hard thing. She knew how to question. When you ask me what I, looking back 30 years, learned from UU religious education, the answer could not be clearer in my mind. I learned how to question. I'll hand it over to Laura. Good morning. Um, you know, I similarly had, you know, oh, this is going well, um, had a similar experience to many, I think, of the young people of, um, you know, it was really nice to have a group of friends who um, were not from our public high schools. Or... Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so we had a group of friends outside of our, our schools and that was really fantastic. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's great to hear about all the thought that the adults put into the RE curriculum. And I was going to share that, you know, my, my best memories from growing up in RE were uh, definitely running around with the kids. Um, um, my earliest memories are with Becky and Andy Tucker. Um, we'd sneak around the the church and try to get the older kids to to include us in their in their games. Um, later on, we were you know it was all about uh, um, all about um, the the Halloween the the haunted houses and the and the Christmas celebrations and um, daring each other to to go in the little there was a little back hallway that had the that had the pottery equipment and we it was really creepy and we dare each other to to run through there so um lots of great memories ski weekends and bike weekends and um and just a lot of you know life lifelong friendships built at pilgrim house i'll stop there <laughs> Ken, we're going to hear the PH song. Am I coming in? Nope. Okay. Well, my goodness, I'm flooded with memories as I hear all this, this sharing, but I came to Pilgrim House uh, as a young college student looking for an alternative, a refugee from a Baptist faith. 
and was immediately taken in a course by the music. We didn't sing hymns, we sang folk songs. Somewhere along the line, at, at that time, uh, they were advertising uh, pH balance shampoo. I do remember the wooden pews, that was a big draw. I like the do-it-yourself nature of, the, of this group. So somehow out of it came this song. P.H. isn't a shampoo. P.H. isn't a skin cream. P.H. won't wash your clothes like new. Pilgrim House is a dream. P.H. isn't a physical phenomenon. Ph.D. don't mean a thing to me. P.H. activity won't be found in chemistry. We are a feeling thing. We got books of songs, so sing along. A coffee pot, it's always hot. Wooden pews, something new. Meet somebody next to you. A program to think about, who knows what it'll be about. Slideshow, I don't know. My friend, it seems to share a dream. You've just got to be there. Because pH isn't a shampoo. pH isn't a skin cream. pH won't wash your clothes like new. Pilgrim House is a dream. pH isn't a physical phenomenon. PhD don't mean a thing to me. pH activity won't be found in chemistry. We are a feeling thing. We got sign up sheets for every week. Membership, come on, get hip. Bring the kids, don't keep them hid. We'll put them down in the basement. Let us know about you, who you are and what you do. Discussion, that's nothing. People that you care about, sing it out and shout it out. We are a sharing thing. PH isn't a shampoo. PH isn't a skin cream. PH won't wash your clothes like new. Pilgrim House is a dream. PH isn't a physical phenomenon. PhD don't mean a thing to me. PH activity won't be found in chemistry. We are a feeling thing. Thank you, Ken. Nick, we're going to start hitting our stride and establishing long range programming. Nick hey, Sheldon. Oh, you want me to pull it? I don't know what it is. Um, hang on a second. I'm getting my text up. It's down here. Oh, okay. Ah, the relationship with Have UUA. Oh, I see. Never mind. Um, had served PH well in only a few short years. By 1992, PH felt reasonably strong. Adult and student programs were robust, and the financial situation was no longer critical. But there were definite signs of growing pains. Both upstairs and downstairs were crowded, and people were beginning to burn out from serving in the same roles year after year. Board meetings in this era tended to go on until 11 o'clock at night. We were thinking about improving or even expanding the building, and we realized we needed to think seriously about what was possible. In June of 1992, the first PH Long Range Planning Committee was formed under the leadership of past chair Carolyn Tucker. There were five of us all together, and over the next year we organized focus groups for members to sound off about what they wanted PH to be or to become, and how we should go about getting there. Our plan was presented in April of 1994 and adopted by the membership at the annual meeting in June. The plan had three main points. Whoops, I just scrolled beyond <laughs> my script. Okay. The first was that we should plan to grow the membership to about 75 adult members so that we could increase the diversity of our membership to uh, get more volunteers and to bring in more pledges. In the short term, this would require strategies to deal with even more crowding. We recommended creating the membership committee for making new members welcome and keeping old ones active. The second point was that we should look for other, forces, other sources of financing, both from inside and outside the group, to acquire the funds necessary for expansion. We recommended creating the finance committee to find the money. 
And the third and probably most important point, we should look for ways to expand the space. Reluctantly, we concluded that zoning in Arden Hills would prohibit expanding the present building. And I remember visiting several other churches on the market, including one on Hodgson Road with the steam boiler from hell. On balance, this first plan served us well, not least because it got us into the habit of periodic planning efforts. We've met the growth target with room to spare. Our financial situation is miles ahead of what anyone thought possible. And we now have reasonable space. As with all attempts to peer into the future, we didn't get everything right. Mina Edson took one look at it and knew we were wrong about the zoning requirements. And she showed brilliantly how a professional architect could bring Arden Hills around to letting us expand on site. And with that, I'll pass it over to Mina. Hi. So since I am an architect, I have a couple pictures. To start. So Pilgrim House Fellowship is 50 years old today. Mom's View District 4 Unified Grade School is turning 77. In my per perception, the building boom around the time of World War II didn't include the construction of one-room schools. They were something from the settlement area era, not the middle of the 20th century. The Department of Education quit publishing the standards for unified grade schools in 1942. District 4 was a relic of an earlier era when it was new. The original school construction plans included the locations for two outhouses about, out back. The new building did have indoor plumbing though. Constructed in 1943, there was an amazing 49 students in the 1950 class photo. I'm gonna change to the next one, Bill. There you go. There's the teacher ratio you had in 1950, one to 49. <laughs> and it's not, we, I'm not real sure what the ages are. It looks like they're probably third grade, maybe the top age, third or fourth, but that's what a unified school was. And uh, by 1962, the educational trend had moved to larger buildings and the district four school closed. So we can still see the kind of backbone of our fellowship hall in this photo from the 1950 photo. And now this is how, where we are today, kind of with that appearance, we, when uh, we worked on, Al worked on, um, Al Potter worked on getting some new lighting not too long ago and we went back to the schoolroom lights. You still see the wood floor, you still see the woodwork, the original doors. So kind of that, that open classroom feel, we still have it in this, in this part of the building. The, um, and I think we've already talked about this a little bit. Uh, Pilgrim House began renting the school building in 1970, purchasing the property in 1972. The basic plan of that open classroom worked for Sunday programs in a space that promoted fellowship without hierarchy, which aligns with their philosophical mission too. That, you know, this isn't, this space when you look at it doesn't scream church. As with other aspects of the operation at Pilgrim House, much of the maintenance of the building was completed by volunteers. My family, kind of, you know, going on to where Dick just left off, began attending Pilgrim House in 1995, and we were immediately struck by how charming this space was, and how welcoming the group was. But the other thing that struck me as an architect was you couldn't walk through the building when the chairs were set up. There's no place to put kids. It was just like a big, a big growing pain at that point. But you know, the the <clears throat> so that those challenges were part of what I started trying to address with uh, when I started joined in with the planning committee to to look at the space again. The you know, and the main initial rebuff from the city, their zoning was parking. We had a specific uh, uh, parking ratio that you needed to achieve when you as per the meeting size. So if we expanded the meeting room size, which is the main thing we wanted to do, was get a bigger meeting room, was you know then parking had to go up. But we were able to work with the city to kind of do a what they call proof of parking, which you do, um, yeah, which we showed out front, which no one ever wanted. 
but we did get permission to expand the building and add the now what what our meeting space is today. So you know this room was still kind of playing off that same idea of a simple room that was you know gave you know different flexible ways to arrange the space and to not be too churchy to be an effective place to do presentations in our meetings and just have more space to spread out, particularly down in the RE. You know, now we have a full, you know, the full basement classrooms. RE was part of that mission of the development. But, you know, the numbers were brought into the planning process and the improvements like enlarging the kitchen, adding the classroom space, we're all part of that initial planning that went along with the long range plan as to, you know, what did we need to support Pilgrim House and the programming and the children's RE in particular. The uh, general, the construction for this edition started in 1998. The general contractor was Transform Tree and they completed the, the shell construction that members put in a lot of sweat equity in the addition and the, and the, and the um, rehabilitation of the old 1943 building. The, the uh, mm. you know, things that members did were, you know, painting and demolition and, you know, just generally it was a lot of moving of stuff around to keep the construction going. And that was all done by volunteers within the church. So now it's been uh, 22 years since the completion of the addition. And there have been ongoing projects throughout that time you know, because things don't stay static. If you own a house, you know that. <laughs> Everything keeps changing. But some of the things that had to happen after that big effort in, you know, in 1998 was capping of the well, replacement of siding, windows, and roof on the 1943 building, extensive landscape work. You know, that's one thing. Our site was really overgrown. It's, it's a little bit over an acre, but we, we kind of had a wild land on the, each of the sides yeah. in the back. Another problem we had was uh, some flooding problems just due to the fact that we needed to get handicapped entries down to the basement and that created a, a way for water to get in the building, but that was corrected by adding a storm pipe in 2011 to get the water out of that space. The, um, you know, other things that have kind of met the changing in the demographic and our techno technological needs or the installation of a new play structure, a new sound and video system, chairs and lighting for the meeting room, you know, our coffee bar and the fellowship hall, installation of a rain garden, and now our recent dark up, we got our solar panels and we have our own electricity, which is pretty great. But, you know, volunteer labor has continued to be an important factor in the planning and execution of the improvements. It takes time to organize and prioritize work throughout the building and site. Al Potter, the current building committee chair, has done a great job of taking on the management of the facility Les Rogers pays special attention to the landscape. They have many helpers in executing the actual work. The building that houses Pilgrim House continues to evolve with our changing demographics, technological and physical needs. The spirit of the one room classroom remains. We learn from each other as well as our teachers. It's a great building. Now we're gonna go on to social actions initiatives by, with Fred Green. Fred? Hi, um, I'm Fred Green, the social action chair. I think you need to mute, Mel. There we go. Oh, okay. Um, in the early days of PH, there were small efforts of social action. I can remember Harold Jensen collecting money for Second Harvest at Thanksgiving. There were various petitions, invitations to join various activities outside of PH. Uh, beginning in the 1980s, um, Pilgrim House joined the UUA and the Social Action Committee was formed. Um, I think there were earlier people worked on the social action committee, but I remember Sue Gross Maseman as the one of the first social action chairs. 
In the next years, members volunteered at Fair Share, worked on Habitat for Humanity projects in the summer, continued food shelf collections, became representatives to the local UU service committee, adopted the Deneen family through family to family ties, and participated in the guest at your table program at Thanksgiving. In addition, social action was discussed in the children's program and the young people did social action projects and continue to do so. In the 1990s and 2000, um, Crop Walk was participated in to raise money for the World War. It began in 1995 and continued through 2001. The fall school supply drive began in 1995 also. And thanks to the efforts of Jane King, Pilgrim House sponsored a child in Haiti, Edmund Alexis. Lisa Berglund started recycling and composting activities at Pilgrim House. Pilgrim House members worked to defeat the marriage amendment which would have outlawed gay marriage. And Pilgrim House became a welcoming congregation, welcoming people regardless of religious orientation. In recent years, Pilgrim House has had several ongoing activities. We provide volunteers to assist clients Tuesday night at the Ralph Reeder Food Shelf which was started by Marcy Jeffries in 1997. We've marched for years on the Pride Parade, walked in the walk for our, a mile for our neighbors and joined in Sing for Our Neighbors, supporting the Community Support Center, which helps people stay in their home. We have had a member, currently Judy Bloom Martinez, on the Community Support Center board. And we have walked in the Hope Fest walk for Alexandra House, a battered woman's shelter. We have donated to an annual winter coat drive, started the social action coterie group to discuss possible actions. And we have donated money to organizations we support. For example, Al Potter's efforts to start the pandemic fund this past spring. So, and with that, I think that pretty well wraps up social action. Next, we'll go on to Les Rogers. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, member-focused initiatives. Uh, throughout the 50-year history of Pilgrim House, members have initiated many activities and social events to build community and get to know one another better. The following is a quick overview. Of course, food always brings people together. For many years, the Hospitality Committee, committee has coordinated the Sunday morning treats and soup Sundays, plus the wonderful food events to celebrate the holiday and other special occasions. Personal storytelling events have taken various forms over the years. In the early 1970s, there was the Sunday night encounter group held in members' homes, following in the later 70s by the life sharing series and the how I came to where I am series. Starting in 2016, we continued this tra tradition with our Sunday stories series after the program. Covenant groups began in 2016. These are small groups who commit to meeting on a regular basis for listening, reflection, and sharing. And prior to Covenant groups, we had the Connections Cafe discussion group. Dinner groups have long been a feature at Pilgrim House. In the early 1970s, gourmet dinner groups were started, often with international or ethnic themes. In December of 1984, the first annual PH New Year's Eve party was held in combination with the gourmet dinner planning meetings. And this combined event went on for a number of years. Back when I joined Pilgrim House in 2005, circle suppers were small groups of members who gathered for a meal and socializing. And circle suppers have transitioned to our current PH night out get togethers. 
Pilgrim House retreats took place in 1989 and 1990 when members held retreats at Camp St. Croix. Uh, a Pilgrim House chapter of Great Decisions was started in 2005 and still continues today. Great Decisions is a nationwide foreign policy education and discussion program. We currently have two book clubs. The original PH book club began in 2006 and the Novel Exchange Book Club began in 2019. Over the years, there have been many trips, especially ski trips and bike trips. And for many of the longer time members, the annual June bike trip in the Lanesboro area became a much loved tradition. Other community building activities over the years have included such things as the Harvest Fest dinner and barn dance, game nights, Halloween parties, theater groups, hay and sleigh rides, and various craft groups. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sharon Borg. Okay, I will, I will briefly add to the history that you've already heard, noting several efforts we have made to be better stewards of our natural world. For each project, there were several dedicated volunteers involved in the initial project and maintenance. I can't name them all, but I want to do a shout out to Les Rogers, who stepped up to lead the work on grounds and landscaping. Up until about a decade ago, as Mina mentioned, a wall of green had grown up on the east and west sides of the Pilgrim House property. Unfortunately, it was buckthorn and other undesirables that were thriving there. This was torn out and trees and grass planted to result in the beautiful landscaping that we enjoy today. As you climb the stairs to enter Pilgrim House, to your left is the Peace Pole and the surrounding garden. This was planted in mostly native plants to control a serious erosion problem. The area slopes resulting in runoff to the sidewalk leading to the lower level entrance. The native plants require less water and maintenance, put down deep roots to control erosion and provide great habitat for pollinators. Not many of you were able to see the garden this spring and summer because of the COVID pandemic, but the flowers and grasses were beautiful. When it rains, water washing over our roof and parking lot carried pollutants through the storm sewer system into nearby lakes and streams. We obtained a grant through the watershed district to cover much of the cost of a rain garden to collect and filter runoff and allow it to soak into the ground instead of going into the storm sewer. This was installed last fall, just west of the driveway. The deep roots of the perennial native flowers, grasses and shrubs in and around the rain garden filter pollutants, offer resiliency and store carbon. They also stabilize the soil and provide habitat for birds, butterflies and beneficial, beneficial insects so critical to our environment. Most recently, through a generous gift from a, gift from a friend of Pilgrim House, solar panels were installed on the roof. They are now hooked up to the system to be able to capture energy from the sun. There is still work to do, but we have made progress in being better stewards for our planet, and thanks to all those who helped to make this happen. And Bill's going to uh, share the Pilgrim House Corral with us. Bill? We've always had a strong tradition here of music uh, within Pilgrim House, dating back to our very, very first programs in 1970. One of our musical traditions, the Pilgrim House Chorale, was initially formed way back in 1986. Luckily, we have a short video recorded uh, uh, in, uh, uh, during a uh, 2015 Thanksgiving program by Ken Shiazawa, son of Koichi Shiazawa, who often sings with us, but is currently in uh, Nice, France right now. Uh, he wandered over there and uh, I think many of you know uh, Koichi uh, contracted COVID uh, as a result of a hospital stay and is now recovered, thankfully. But uh, nevertheless, he is not able to be here today. 
I also picked this recording because it includes Ed Joyce, who would have loved to be with us today. He was so looking forward to our 50th anniversary. Please enjoy Let There Be a Voice by the Pilgrim House Chorale. <laughs> good hearing the Corral again. I can't wait until we can get together again to sing like that. It's a wonderful, maybe small, but mighty group. Great to be around. Now we're moving on to our next 50 years. The current, uh, let, let me uh, stop sharing here. The um, the current pandemic has turned our world upside down. Uh, but just as we uh, weathered the difficulties around the, uh, 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 around the formation 50 years ago, I'm happy to report that we seem to be successfully adjusting to and working through these pandemic times. Uh, our uh, last in-person Pilgrim House meeting this year was Sunday, way back, Sunday, March 8th. But just before that, on March 6th, the first confirmed COVID case was recorded in Minnesota. And during the following week, cases quickly multiplied. And by week's end, Governor Walz had instituted a state of emergency. We quickly canceled our Sunday, March 15th and 22nd programs, while several of us scrambled for an approach to continue under a virtual meeting format. Wayne LeBlanc mobilized our Pilgrim House tech team and within a week, we established a plan to continue future meetings via Zoom. Our first virtual program was held Sunday, March 29th, and to date we've held 20 Sunday programs virtually on Zoom. In addition, we've also held numerous Zoom coffee hours, book club meetings, board meetings, committee meetings, and more. Although everyone understandably longs for the day when we can again meet in person, I've actually reaped some, we've actually reaped some benefits during this virtual period. We've welcomed back several members who had previously moved away, but are now again able to join us virtually. I noticed in the participant screen today that we have members from as far away as Turkey and uh, in here in the United States over in the West Coast and Seattle. 
we've welcomed back several members who have uh, now able to join us like that. Plus, we've been able to attract speakers from uh, as far as way as uh, Seattle. We had a pastor from Seattle just a couple weeks ago. Thanks to today's technologies, we're able to continue supporting each other during these unprecedented times. And we look forward to seeing uh, you and all again on Zoom next week and beyond as we continue adjusting to these and other challenges in this 21st century. Mel? Sure, the, uh, the social fabric of uh, religion is changing. Uh, the Pew Research Group has done studies on religion in America for more than four decades. They have found that most organized religions are losing population. In the past decade, Protestants have gone from 51 to 43% and Catholics from 24 to 20. The nuns, the people who, are, who have no religious organization but still feel spiritual have grown from 24 to 37%. Some people thought that that gave the UUs a leg up with the increase in nuns, our former president Morales believed that this past decade would be the decade of the UUs. Uh, but, and that we would grow exponentially. Uh, obviously that didn't happen. Only the Mormons and the UUs, however, are organized religions that show any growth. Don't get too excited. I mean, the growth is, is moderate for sure. So according to the, the Pew Research Group, who are UUs? Well, mostly we're white. 88% of us are white. They are third generation Americans or longer, 87% of us. We are more wealthy than most. 43% make more than $100,000. We are highly educated. 36% of UUs have postgraduate degrees. Belief in God is about even, 47 to 46. Our party affiliation is Democrat, 82%. And UUs have the highest acceptance for LGBTQ and acceptance for sex, same-sex marriages among all religions, 96 and 94%. So nationally, UUs are Democrats who are well-educated and tolerate metal, metal, many views. Here at PH, we are primarily white Democrats who are well-educated and tolerate many views. That is our past and maybe that's our future. There's an online questionnaire that, um, that seems to work. It's based on, it bases its questions on your attitudes. And then it tells you which, which religion you might be more comfortable in. I've used it trying to, trying to create a specific thing to a specific religion. It works every time. So I suggest to you, when you talk to friends and relatives, don't try to convince them. To, to join you, you tell them to take the quiz and let them go to the religion that most fits their uh, personal beliefs. And I put that, uh, I put the, the, uh, the way to get to it on the chat. And I'm gonna put it in right now. Mel, I think you muted yourself for those last few comments. You're muted. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to Adam and Aaron. <laughs> okay. Thanks, so uh, I know a lot of people worked really hard on the remodel, but it was a really hard time for me. Uh, at that time, uh, the old building was an important part of what Pilgrim House was for me. Uh, I really liked sitting on the wooden benches. Um, I was looking forward to the day I was going to be old enough to go into that even smaller closet classroom under the stairs where all the cool older kids got to go to class. Um, I enjoyed that every holiday, all us kids would go in the basement and eat together. Um, it's been a while now, but I guess it's not so bad that we can all eat upstairs together and the projector and the modern speakers are pretty nice. and. I guess I've probably daydreamed a few times about what I would do with the next expansion. Uh, it's, it's hard now that we can't all meet in person, but every week I talk to my dad and he's excited about some new speaker that he's got that would never even be possible to even think about in past years. Um, committee and board meetings are a lot easier to attend when I don't have to go, now that it's starting to get cold, I don't have to go out to my car and drive to Arden Hills anymore to, every week 
or a couple times a week. Um, uh, already a couple times this year, I've been able to attend church when I've been out of town and in a normal year, I wouldn't be able to. Uh, or like today, we've seen lots of visitors that haven't been able to make it to Pilgrim House in years. Uh, I still think that Pilgrim House is important as a place. I'm excited to get back there and sing and eat together and um, all of that. But it, it's nice to know that it doesn't have to be a place, that there's still a Pilgrim House, even if we can't all get together uh, in person in that one place, uh, and that this group is important. Um, maybe there's some things that we see as workarounds now today that in the future we're going to see as a normal part of Pilgrim House, that we're going to see this as a, as a turning point. Uh, where we, we became something new and different. And I, I think that's all I have, Aaron. Thank you. Um, well, as you know, uh, I'm part of the, the family that's got four generations coming to PH. Uh, my grandparents started going there back in the early days. And oh, this guy hasn't been there physically yet, but he's been to a couple Zoom meetings. Um, and I wanted to talk about the things that have impacted me the most that makes me want to send my children to Pilgrim House. Um, I love going to the programs and doing all the, the um, social gatherings. And I remember as a kid, some of the stuff Laura was talking about, like, and, and Adam talking about the Halloween haunted house and all that fun stuff. But the stuff that's impacted me the most has been um, RE, has been, um, well, be grumpy it's mommy's turn to talk has been like the owl program our whole lives um having that like uh sex ed in a a big a group where you know, there's no judgment and oh kellen i'm gonna get rid of you give your daddy a thing okay but i tell people about that and they're like you have sex ed in church that's so scandalous but really it's really a place where um there's no judgment and you really learn what you need to know best. I felt that way. Oh, good job, Kyle. You came to save me. Thank you. <laughs> um, and the other biggest thing was doing the coming of age program, becoming an adult and uh, going to different religions, learning about how, uh, how religion functions in other routes, going to see different um, communities and, and building our own uh credo and what we see to to be spirituality for us it made me ask a lot of really critical questions and uh become a more of an open-minded person i think and that's what i want most for my kids is to have them ask those questions what does spirituality to them um what is important in being a good person uh that's what i what's most special to me and what i think is going to keep sending uh, our future generations coming back and wanting to learn more and wanting to be those uh, open-minded um, people. Thank you. I'll send it over to Bill. Well, thank you so much. And it's uh, really neat to see the uh, new generations taking over and the generation after that. By the way, for many of you may not be aware that uh, Adam uh, is our, our current chair for, uh, for Pilgrim House. Reaching back into the Wayback Machine, uh, Carol uh, selected uh, this song that we sang way back in the very early days and haven't done in decades. Uh, but we thought it would uh, kind of be fitting in terms of the world keeping rolling on. Uh, it's written by Bob uh, Larimore, but to give you an idea of how long this song has been around, Marlene Dietrich, it was the last song that she recorded in German, of course. Unbelievable. So anyhow, here we are with Carol leading us and please uh, remain on mute, uh, but uh, do sing along with us. Carol, here we go. Still the world keeps 
I have a uh, I have a big red mark on my uh, script here that says if we have time. Well, guess what? We're going to take time. We're going to close with these words written by Dick Otten and published on our our first issue of uh, the the front page of our our first history, as it beautifully captures the vision of Pilgrim House formation. It's relevant to who we are and what we strive to be today and as it was back then. It's called allowing. I am a child of the universe, a searcher traveling on planet Earth. And all the world is my family, the flowers in the field, the birds of the air, the stars, the sun, the atoms, the cosmos, the total spectrum of humankind. They are all my nurturing families. Before I give to them, I first receive from them every day of my life. The heart that beats within me beats not of its own, but with the pulsing of the universe. The mind that conceives within me conceives not of itself, but with the current of the creating mind. The blood that courses through me is not of my origin. It is the life bearing tonic of the ages. I need not create these realities. They already surge within and around me, seeking my good. I need not try to force them into being. I have, all, I have only to conform to their inner ordering and allow them to be. For those of you that did not know, this was put together by a rather large committee, and I'm not going to thank them all, but I am going to thank Carol Gross, who chaired the effort and put found more and more information for us. Um, we could put on 40 hours. Um, next, uh, next week, we were supposed to have Roxanne Ortiz, the author of the UU Common Read, Indigenous History of the United States, but she has a deadline on a book that she's doing for Beacon Press, which is the UU Press. And she asked to be put off further into the year. So we will, we will bring her back, but she's not going to be here next. So next week, we're going to move a program I was going to do in uh, closer to, to the actual election time. Now, you know, the election is, is Tuesday, but Tuesday, then it's December 14th when the 10 electors for the state of Minnesota actually cast Minnesota's ballot. Uh, if uh, assuming Biden wins in Minnesota, I'm going to be one of those 10 electors. Uh, I've done some history. Uh, I've done some some um, reading and, and and studying on what the electoral college is. So next week we will have a, a program on the electoral college, how do how we got it, how it works, why it's undemocratic, and why what we might be able to do about it. So with that, we're going to continue the the the, the chalice. We're not going to extinguish the chalice yet, but we can end end the recording now, Bill. And we'll go into introductions and, uh, and, 